I think we can um, start. Um, welcome everyone to today's um, seminar on spatial data. Um, everyone could kind of like mute themselves. Okay, that looks good. So it's my great pleasure, of course, to um, introduce um, uh, Luca Marconato, who's currently doing his um, PhD in Ali Stegler's group at the EMBL in uh, Heidelberg, um, Germany. And um, today, Luca will talk about um, spatial data, um, a new framework uh, for the analysis of um, spatial omics data. And I think if we um, think back a little bit here to some of our earlier CCB seminars on R and um, Python-based um, frameworks for spatial omics data, such as um, spatial experiment and also SquidPy, then I think um, Luca's new um, spatial data framework uh, represents in um, certain ways a bit of a rethinking of how to best um, represent um, a spatial omics data. Um, uh, and he builds here on, I think, emerging imaging standards but also uh, data structures and aggregation techniques from the geospatial um, data field, um, overall resulting in a, in, a, in a broadly applicable framework to, I think, all major um, spatial omics technologies. So with that, I'm uh, very much uh, looking forward to your talk, um, Luca. And without further ado, I'm just sending it over to you. And um, as a note for the audience, um, we will have some 15 minutes um, at the end of the presentation for questions, and um, folks can also use the chat to post questions during the talk. All right, over to you, Luca. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. I share my screen. Okay, can you see the slides? Nice. Yes. So good morning, everybody. Um, uh, again, thank for the opportunity to present uh, the project uh, that I built together with my team. And uh, I want to thank also Giovanni, Kevin, and Isaac uh, that uh, are the core developers uh, of uh, this uh, framework. So I will describe uh, spatial data, an open interoperable framework for uh, spatial omics for storage, processing, and visualization. And uh, let's start uh, with the motivation of uh, why we built it. We built this framework, and let's consider data from Visium to Next Genomics that, as you know, is composed of ACNE stained image of high resolution and a gene expression, expression part with an hexagonal, an hexagonal grid of circular boxes. Uh, let's imagine the data to be as it comes out from a space ranger and to have it stored on disk and to be interested in proceeding with tasks like visualization. Uh, we can also take the image part and process it, uh, for instance, uh, to look at um, uh, cell segmentation, and then we can uh, consider uh, the gene expression part uh, to do some downstream analysis. When we want to save the results of this processing operation, we are um, putting them to the original format, but uh, in this way, we are changing the, the raw data. And now if you want to proceed with tasks like visualization, of course it's still possible, but it can be less straightforward because maybe the visualization tool is expecting the data from space render while different tools can output a different type of uh, uh, data. And uh, if you want to continue downstream, and here I put an example of using Zotto from the R programming language uh, this time, and we want to save the data back to disk, now the storage becomes even more complex because we are mixing Python-specific objects with raw data and maybe with R-specific objects. So this slide shows the first two challenges when working with spatial omics data. First, having a way to represent both raw but also process data. And the second, having a way to support interoperable workflow across programming languages. But this was a very simple example because I was considering one Visium slide, while modern datasets consider multiple samples and multiple field of views that can contain a different spatial alignment. And also, it's important to highlight that the data itself can be large. In this case, there are not so many uh, circular locations, but uh, the images are uh, high resolution and dealing with them, even with just one of them, can be computation computationally intensive. So again, there are two challenges here. One is spatial alignment, and the second is dataset sizes. And uh, again, with sizes, uh, I include the number of points, the resolution of the image, the number of sample can be in different directions. 
This Unten X is not just one format, because if you have uh, to be precise, there are multiple versions of Space Ranger, and each of them um, lead to data that is slightly different. And there are, of course, different technologies, both experimental technologies uh, and commercial technologies. And this landscape uh, is a challenge for the user because uh, of the heterogeneity of technologies, but also heterogeneity of file formats. And finally, the uh, last uh, axis of complexity is given by the fact that uh, uh, sometimes it's relevant to profile the tissue not just with one modality, but with uh, multiple, uh, um, uh, multiple technologies. And the reason to do this is that uh, uh, different modalities can carry orthogonal signals. So here I show an example of a breast cancer study from Tenex Genomics. This example will um, return uh, uh, later in the, in the slides. And um, in this data set, the same breast cancer sample, uh, actually consecutive slices, have been analyzed with Visium, with Xenium, and also with uh, uh, single cell RNA-seq. And the reason to do this is that Xenium is very accurate in giving cell locations and cell boundaries, but it only covers a few hundred genes. But uh, if we integrate the single cell RNA-seq information with Xenium, we can derive cell types, identify cell types from the single cell data, and then map them accurately in space. Uh, if then we consider a data set like Visium that is unbiased with spatial information, we can, for instance, study cancer clonality. And also with Visium, the HNI image can be used to study anatomical regions of interest. And here there is the need of having a representation that is not separate between these modalities, but having a joint multimodal representation. And together with this, another challenge is to support multimodal operation that uh, uh, bring together the various layers of information, considering the spatial alignment to, to drive uh, a joint conclusion. So uh, all these challenges uh, were the reason why we decided to try to uh, build a solution. And with we, I mean the SCVerse core team, uh, with our experience with uh, um, single cell and spatial omics data analysis, the open microscopy environment uh, with it, it ex its experience with uh, uh, dealing with very large images and uh, having uh, standard representations, and the Napari core team uh, with uh, its experience in interactive visualization and annotation. So we decided to try to work together on a framework uh, that we called uh, spatial data, and uh, this is a framework uh, for data storage, manipulation, and visualization. And also, we rely heavily on Python geographical information system libraries, because there is a whole work on geospatial uh, data sets that uh, we could uh, uh, build on top. Uh, unknown goal is that uh, our framework is not an analysis library. This is not uh, the new SquidPy, but this is a, a framework that SquidPy now can build on to generalize its, its function with the new data set. So uh, now I want to describe um, the, the framework, and I will start with a high-level description of the components and the ideas behind the framework. I will show some examples, and then I will gradually go uh, more and more into detail. So the idea of a framework starts by an abstraction. Uh, we realize that we can represent any spatial omics data set as a combination of different geometries. And we have both raster geometries, namely images and labels. Labels are also known as segmentation masks, and the vector geometries, such as points, circles, and polygons. These geometries can be annotated with external tables, and we use in memory the mData data structure, which is popular in the single cell Python world. Uh, together with this, in memory, we also use, as mentioned before, data structures from the geospatial libraries like X-ray, GeoPandas, and Dask for lazy loading and lazy computation. On disk, we use, uh, we, we adhere uh, whenever possible, uh, and I will uh, tell uh, of the differences later, uh, on the OMI and ZFF specification, which is implemented in the OME ZAR implementation. And uh, ZAR allows for performance storage and access uh, um, also in parallel, uh, both from uh, uh, the disk and from the cloud of uh, large uh, tensor uh, data and metadata. And the user has the possibility of aligning these uh, spatial elements in any order, in any number, and also considering uh, uh, different coordinate transformations. In fact, the OME and ZFF defines uh, uh, coordinate transformation between different coordinate systems, and uh, we support uh, any number of uh, coordinate systems, such as uh, uh, physical space, uh, uh, space, pixel space, uh, uh, some sample space, uh, and so on. And here I want to highlight uh, a difference that we'll cover uh, later in the talk uh, between uh, 
transforming the data and representing a transformation. So by default, we use the force method in which we store the raw data. And together with the data, we have some metadata that tells how the data should be transformed. So this metadata can be is very lightweight and can be changed without having to touch the raw data. Still, we, pro we provide the user with the possibility of transforming the actual data so that the new tensor can be saved back to the storage. And here is an example of six data sets. These are raw data sets before we process them with our framework. And uh, I want to highlight uh, the heterogeneity of file formats that can be find, found uh, with, uh, with real uh, data sets. Uh, here we see CSV file, T file, feather file, and so on. And uh, if uh, as a developer or as a user, you want to adapt existing methods uh, to these uh, new data sets, uh, can be very time consuming uh, and tedious uh, to convert them. This inst is instead, after we convert the data to ZAR, we have uh, one ZAR store. Uh, data.zar is a Merfish dataset. And here, uh, if we print it, uh, we can see the data abstraction that I showed before. The, the data is composed into images, points, shapes, tables. The coordinate systems are described, in this case, just one. And then we can continue with uh, on this object with the other task. For instance, here, I'm calling Napari special data, which is our plugin for interactive visualization and annotation. And this is uh, the output uh, of uh, uh, the tool. And we, say we see gene expression plotting on the circular cells. They have uh, various uh, uh, ready. There are single molecule points uh, which are annotated and then polygonal descriptions of a layer of the visual cortex uh, of this mouse brain. And here I want to go a bit more in general, uh, showing uh, how we can deal with different technologies. We built uh, a library called uh, Spatial Data IO that allows to read uh, different uh, standard file formats from popular commercial platform and represent them with a unified representation within our in-memory object. From this, we can also write to the OME ZAR uh, storage format so that the initial data is represented in the same way. Uh, is, is not uh, finishing uh, here because uh, ZAR allows um, for a performance representation. So now we can actually lazy load the data and exploit uh, the performance uh, improvement. And an example of this, I want to thank the, the people that collaborated with in this part. An example of this is data visualization. So we developed two plugins. One is called Special Data Plot and one Napari Special Data, respectively, for static and interactive visualization. And uh, using uh, these um, two libraries, uh, we can uh, represent uh, all uh, the data, uh, visualize all the data independently from the technology they come from. And uh, here is an example of visualization with uh, Napari special data, in which uh, you can see the different types of geometries, multiple samples, multiple coordinate transformations. Uh, here uh, we have also UMAP plot that can be explored together with the, uh, the spatial information. Every, everything can be shown uh, together um, independently of the initial uh, format uh, of uh, origin. And uh, I want to now discuss a bit more about the performance representation that Zara allows. So let's suppose to have an image, a full resolution, uh, high resolution image. The ZAR representation starts by dividing the image in different chunks. And then also the full image is downscaled multiple times. And each of this scale is then chunked uh, again. So what we end up with is a format in which if we need this portion of the data and this resolution, we can load it efficiently from a particular chunk without having to load the full data as it happens with other file formats. And here is an example on the breast cancer data set that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, in which we start from the raw data and we align the data uh, until uh, visualization and downstream analysis. So let's start with data alignment. In here, you can see in pink the HNE stained image from um, uh, the Visium data, and in uh, black and white, uh, the immunofluorescent image from Xenium. And the data, this is uh, as it comes from uh, Tenex Genomics, is not aligned. We need uh, to find an affine transformation that maps the two data together. So we used uh, Napari special data to identify landmark location in both images, and then the special data framework to find the fine transformation between uh, the two images and save it back to disk. Now the user, when uh, will open the data again, we'll find the data aligned. And here is an example in which the data that has already been aligned is explored with Napari. I'm sharing the screen to my iPad, and you can see that I can zoom and pan very efficiently thanks to the performance of ZAR. Here I'm annotating the immune infiltration compartment of this sample, and together there are other annotations that I made before. 
and the, the plugin allows to save it back to ZAR and use it in downstream analysis. So next, uh, I show how an Apari spatial data can also visualize different annotation together. And uh, for instance, on the right side, we plot the gene expression on vision data, cell types on Xenium cells. Then we plot uh, the three images from uh, Physium and the two one from Xenium, and also the, the, the polygonal, information, polygonal regions that we annotated before with the iPad. This uh, type of plotting is supported by the composability of uh, Napari of uh, our um, plotting libraries, uh, for instance, uh, spatial data plot. And here you can see that uh, the user can decide can decide what to render, like images, labels, points, uh, can decide which channel uh, to, to color and in which color, and for instance, how to enrich uh, the various geometries with the annotation uh, uh, information that is present in the data. So this was about visualization, but the framework uh, is also about uh, multimodal uh, operations. We implemented a series of operations such as data transformation, spatial queries, feature aggregation, rasterization, uh, tiling. And the idea is that uh, this operation can be applied on our data structure, giving us output, uh, again, uh, the same data type. And this uh, operation is either lazy, either computing, it depends on the particular operation uh, being used. And the user can also sometimes uh, update the initial object, both in memory and on disk, without having to create uh, copies of the data. So here I want to show some example of, this trans of these operations. One is a data transformation that I uh, touched before and I will describe more in detail later. One is a rasterization. Uh, one are a spatial queries to uh, query different portion of the data set uh, together in space. One is feature aggregation that allows to combine different modalities uh, between uh, various spatial elements, various layers. And the one is a tiling operation with an interface to deep learning libraries. So let's start with the spatial queries. Here is a code example of defining a bounding box in our coordinate system. This is the name of the coordinate system for this data set. And um, uh, this uh, operation returns a spatial data objects in which everything is cropped to this coordinate system. Not just the image, but also the geometries and also the table is filtered to contain only the rows that correspond to a geometry inside this bounding box. And here on the right side, we see a more complex example with a polygon is used to do the same operation and a square. Um, here on the bottom, and uh, on top, um, I show how I could reproduce this plot using uh, the flexibility of a spatial data plot to combine uh, the various uh, components uh, of the original data and the query data. Now, a second example is uh, um, similar to query operation, is uh, creating tiles from the original data set. So it's, uh, it's internally using the query operation, but this is optimized for performance since we want to use downstream uh, uh, deep learning framework and training a deep learning model. So in this example that is uh, shown also in uh, the paper, we'll put the link in the end, we tile the original data set and we want to predict a cell type of uh, the cells for which the tiles are uh, constructing around, constructed around. So I say it again, here we have uh, a it's an image from Visium. We have a Xenium cells, and they are aligned with an affine transformation, the one that I found before. And what we want is around its Xenium cell to find a Visium image style. And uh, the APIs that we provide allows to do this efficiently and uh, in a convenient way to then train a, a neural network to predict this, that we, uh, we downloaded the weight from Monai showing an example of how we can interface uh, with deep learning uh, frameworks. And now is an example on uh, aggregation, the aggregation operation. So the aggregation operation allows to combine a source value, a signal, into target geometries. In this case, we are aggregating uh, transcripts into cells using the count function. We are counting the transcript inside uh, these cells. And uh, in this example, the output is this uh, gene expression table that is annotating the cell. The aggregation operation is uh, actually gen is, is more general than just this case. So here in this slide, I show the, the full possibilities of aggregation operations in which the source values are not just points, but can be, they can be images, circles, polygons, labels. And here I wrote equivalent representations for circles, polygons, and labels because we can see it better here. Sometimes where we are not interested in being pixel perfect, we can represent the same informations like cells in different ways, depending on uh, what is more convenient right now. And uh, the general aggregation operation uh, will support uh, 
this, uh, this more general case, uh, in which uh, any source value can be aggregated into different target geometries, it can be circles, polygons, or labels, uh, and the result are these same target geometries, but that are, uh, are annotated with the information from the source values. So we implemented uh, most of them, but some of them are not implemented yet because the rasterization operation is still not fully developed when it's uh, complete, uh, all of this will be supported across coordinate systems. So let's see some examples from uh, the paper. Here we have, uh, again, the Xenium dataset with the cells now are represented uh, as um, in this plot as circles, so they can be represented as polygons, both work, and we aggregate them into the regions of interest that we annotated with the iPad with the aim of studying cell type fractions in these regions of interest. So this is what we obtain for the immune infiltration region for Xenium 1. And here is an example also in which we repeat the operation for a different sample that is aligned for the same field of view and also for a Visium dataset that is aligned again from the same field of view. Or to be precise, we first deconvoluted using cell to location gene expression uh, into the Visium, uh, sorry, cell types into Visium circles. And now we use the, the cell types inside the Visium circles to aggregate them inside these polygonal regions. And uh, here we can compare the different centile fractions between uh, different replicates. Another example is uh, in which we aggregate transcripts from Xenium into Visium geometries, obtaining what we see here in the top. So this is, a, 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 let's say, an artificial Visium dataset, and we can compare this with the real Visium dataset for the same reason with the objective of quality control, for instance. And here I will not go much into the details. You can find this in the paper. We show how we could compare the two Xenium replicate and the Xenium replicate one with Visium, and we observe that uh, the intensity of gene expression correlates uh, with the degree of agreement uh, between uh, the various uh, samples. Uh, and uh, as expected, we saw more agreement between uh, the two Xenium replicates uh, with respect to Xenium versus Visium. So this can be useful with uh, uh, tech uh, uh, QC. And uh, here, a final example of aggregation shows actually the code to obtain the results that I showed in the previous slides. So we see that uh, we are using the same API, the aggregate function, and the first arguments, the one that starts with values, uh, describe uh, the signal, where to aggregate uh, the information, and by describe the target geometries to aggregate uh, the information uh, into. Value key shows what we want to aggregate. So on the left, we want to aggregate the cell type information. On the right, we aggregate feature name that describes which gene is present in the single molecule transcripts. And uh, the aggregation function on the right is count. On the left, uh, we are interested in cell type fractions. So we have this uh, normalization parameter to fraction. And finally, the target coordinate system specifies that we want to aggregate the information in that coordinate system with the data is aligned, and we call this coordinate system aligned. So this shows that uh, with one function, we can cover uh, uh, various uh, cases of uh, data configurations uh, leading to an ergonomic interface uh, to the user. And uh, finally, I want to conclude uh, with the transformation operation that I uh, mentioned before, and here we can go a bit more in detail. So let's start uh, with how we represent the transformation on disk. We rely on the OM and ZFF specification that uh, for the transformation was uh, uh, built primarily by John. And uh, on the left, we see that on disk, the transformation look like a JSON uh, file with the coordinate system and the, it, its axes and its names are specified. And the coordinate transformation is specified by telling between which coordinate system this is defined and which type and which data it uh, describes. And um, here we show, uh, we see how special data in memory implements this specification into a convenient uh, user interface. So we are defining a translation that translates by 10 units the y-axis and by 20 units the z-axis. And here we are setting the transformation inside the element my image into the coordinate system that we call the sample one. And here there is a difference between the, this specification that the, this function can be called independently of the element that we are using. The element can be a CYX image, a CZYX image, a ZYX labels, can be points to D3Ds. It doesn't matter because the transformation is then inferred 
for the axes that are missing. And this is true for all the types of transformation that we support. The on this specification is more, more strict because the main purpose of on this specification is to be uh, very uh, easy to parse from different programming languages. And so if we have a CYX image on disk and we want to translate this by, um, by only the X, we still need to specify the C, the Y, the Z to be complete. And uh, the framework that we built does this for the user. On the right, we see an example of actually calling the transform operation. We can call it in two ways. The first one we call transform to coordinate system. And this returns a new special data object. This is a lazy representation uh, of the, all the elements that are transformed into the new coordinate system. Or uh, we can also get the transformation out of the object, for instance, the image, and uh, transform the image manually calling the transform operation. The user has the possibility of both approaches. And uh, here I want to show um, more details about the implementation of a transformation operation and also touching uh, some of the limitations that we currently have. So in this example, I'm defining an affine transformation that is rotating by an angle theta, is translating by a factor k, and is, uh, is scaling by a factor k, and is translating by x and y. And we can define this by passing the affine matrix to the transformation, or also we support, uh, as the NZFS specification defines, uh, different uh, uh, sequences of uh, operations uh, that uh, can be combined together. So we can uh, first define the rotation, then the scale, then translation, put them uh, together in a sequence of transformation. So let's suppose for this example that k equal to 4 and to have an image of 100, of, of 100 by 100 pixels. The current implementation, when it transforms the image, does two things. Uh, applies the rotation uh, part or the shear part uh, by doing some corner padding. Then it keeps the, the translation. So the translation is actually not, not applied. We are not uh, adding uh, a black padding for the translation. It's, uh, it's still then present inside the, the transformation of the object and uh, is uh, increasing the pixels, in this case, uh, by four times. This is bad. This is bad because we are uh, making the data larger than it should be. And also this translation uh, is still here. The user could find a bit confusing that uh, the translation is still present inside the object. The reason why we did this uh, was that uh, we wanted to start with uh, an initial implementation and then maybe refine. And uh, because this um, is closer to the NZFS specification, the NZFS specification doesn't uh, transform the coordinates, it transforms the pixels. And uh, so if you want to transform the image, we wanted to actually create a new tensor that starts from zero, I put uh, approximately because of the corner padding. But uh, what we want to implement in the new, uh, in, in a new implementation of the transformations is combining idea from OME and ZFF and X-Ray. X-Ray allows to transform coordinates, but it doesn't support uh, transformation with a rotation or a shear part. Uh, still, we designed a way to put them together. So this will be the output of a new implementation in which the image will be still 100 by 100 pixels, except for the corner padding that is uh, offloading the, the rotation or shear part. And then the coordinates will be actually adjusted to include for the uh, translation part. This is actually a 400, not a 100. I just realized that there is a typo. Um, so this is the, the new implementation. And it will be more performant and also more ergonomic because of these uh, coordinates. Also, uh, there is now uh, another detail regarding uh, coordinate transformations. So um, here uh, I, I show the current implementation. Again, I talk about limitations and how we will implement them. So let's suppose to have one special element and uh, this uh, is uh, defined uh, with a transformation to map it to the coordinate system one. And let's suppose also to have a second special element and a coordinate transformation that maps it to the coordinate system one. Let's also suppose to have a third element and a third coordinate system, but now the transformation contains a rotation part. So now with the special data, we can already ask the framework to find the transformation between these two elements, these two coordinate system, or let's say this element here and the coordinate system too. And internally, the graph of the transformation is constructed. The path is uh, traversed in this way. If there are multiple paths, the user will be worn and will have the possibility to choose with path to follow. But in the end, the green arrow will be computed from the existing information. The problem, uh, and, and this will allow to map the blue image in this case in the coordinate system too. 
The problem is that the current implementation doesn't allow to map coordinate systems between them. Here we have elements mapped to coordinate system. We don't have coordinate systems mapped to coordinate system. So the elements are always in the internal space. In this case, we call it the pixel space. But we can say, I, I want to find this transformation between one and two and save it to disk, or between these two elements and save it to disk. And the reason of not adding this possibility is linked to the way we, we don't transform coordinates. So if we fix the problem that I showed in the previous slide, also this is, is fixed. And the, the new implementation will work like this. So this is how it will look like. We will drop the intrinsic space, so we will not have the pixel space anymore. Every image, every element will already live within a coordinate system. So in this case, we don't need to align with the transformation, the coordinate system one and the, uh, the, the, image, the blue image and the green image, because they both live in the same coordinate system and the coordinates are already enough to specify how they are aligned together. When we save to disk, the framework will create a NZFF transformation to store this transformation because uh, NZFF doesn't allow to save for coordinates. We need to drop the coordinates, save uh, translations, and when we read, we drop the translation, we save the we, we load the coordinate. But um, it uh, it uh, it will be so allow to have everything already aligned. For the emas, the, the purple emas, this is not possible because it contains a rotation, so this can't be in the same coordinate system of the green, and that's why. This is coordinate system one, and this is another coordinate system, coordinate system four. Still, we can define coordinate transformation between coordinate systems. Now it will be allowed. And so we can recover all the cases from before and be even more general and ergonomic. So the last thing about transformation that I want to touch is that uh, um, we are working also on supporting nonlinear transformations. This is the work of a uh, uh, master student, Tobias. And um, we, um, and NZFF supports nonlinear displacement and coordinate fields. So we will allow not just to limit ourselves to a fine transformation, but work with nonlinear deforma deformation maps with the same system that I described before of coordinate systems. So this was regarding coordinate transformations. Now a different topic. And again, I want to start by showing the current implementation, highlight some of the limitations of the current implementation, and describe how will be the future implementation that we want to adopt. So here I will describe how to save annotations together with uh, uh, images and the geometries. So let's suppose to have um, a labels, a segmentation mask with uh, three cells, one to three, and the background. So what we can do is that we can have uh, an expression matrix. Uh, doesn't need to mess one to one the cells. Here the background is not present. And uh, each row contains, uh, so it's transposed with respect to the uh, R representation. Each rows represent one cell, each column uh, a variable. We can uh, use the same table to annotate also different types of geometries, uh, such as polygons and circles. One limitation of the current uh, approach is that points can't be annotated with external tables. We can only put the notation together uh, with the points. Uh, we see this in the next slide. And uh, also, the current implementation allows uh, only to store uh, one table. So if we have one special data object, we can only have uh, one table to it. If we need more table, we, we need to have multiple special data objects, which still works. We show this in the paper, but it's not as ergonomic as it could be. Um, so this is the current implementation. We have uh, the table that is annotated in the first uh, geometries. And uh, let's suppose to have a second set of geometries, so two samples, let's say. We can still use the same table to annotate both geometries. The way this is done is that uh, our table, so the, on the left, we have the matrix in the data object, table.x. Uh, table on the right, we have the obs. So this, uh, if you're not familiar with n data, is uh, a data frame that is annotating uh, this uh, axis of the matrix. So the data object is a matrix with uh, the borders being annotated, annotated by data frames or extra tensors. So we, we call together this information table. So here in the OPS, we see how this matrix is mapped to the samples. We have two columns. One is telling which samples we are annotating, and the second one is telling which number, which index the row refers to. And then we have a column containing the actual notation, for instance, a categorical value. So we need to store the information that this column is annotating the sample and this column is annotating the index. And to do this, right now, in the metadata of the table, we store three keys. They are called the region, region key, and instant key. 
instance key that contain this information. Uh, limitation of this approach uh, is that uh, after uh, releasing the beta version, we got the feedback from uh, uh, many users that they found uh, a bit cumbersome to work with these uh, regions. They, they found it not clear from the names, and uh, uh, they say that this was not uh, was feeling weird. And uh, also, the second limitation is that there is only one table, as I said, um, attached to the special data object. An advantage is that. Uh, we can have uh, multiple uh, samples annotated by the same table. But uh, if uh, one considers that uh, this free metadata needs to be processed manually, maybe it's not mass an advantage, it's actually a complication. So we decided that uh, with the new implementation, we will most likely drop uh, this, and I will show in the next slide the new implementation. And uh, also, here um, we have a second way to store information. So the shapes are actually Zeopandas data frames in memory. Uh, the points are also data frames, so there is actually not the need to store uh, an external table if the notation is small. If the notation is just one column that is telling uh, which color it is with cell or uh, which disease uh, category it is, we can just add it to the data frame. If we have uh, a dense uh, matrix or like even better a sparse matrix, uh, then we need to have an external table, otherwise we are storing this in an inefficient way. But uh, we let the user store all the information within the Zeopandas data frame. There are these two ways to store uh, columns. And when plotting, aggregating, and so on, both are supported. So this here shows the use case for why we want to extend the current design to support multiple tables. And uh, here we have two segmentation masks. We can imagine these are two output of two different heuristics for finding cell segmentation. And we can imagine that uh, most of the cells are recovered in both segmentation masks, but maybe some of them are present only in one of the segmentation masks. So the tables that are notating this information, like within expression, are mismatching in the indexing indexes. So here it's more natural to have two tables. Uh, furthermore, if we have uh, multiple uh, downstream uh, quantities that are derived like image features com computed starting from uh, this segmentation mass, it is even more natural to add extra tables. So this uh, is what we want to implement. We want to have uh, the possibility to have uh, one or more table per element, uh, and we want to avoid, uh, limit the possibility of having one table shared between elements. So the user will have to concatenate manually, but uh, we realize that it's probably more ergonomic. Finally, within the SCVerse ecosystem, uh, we have uh, a library called the new data, multimodal data, that uh, allows uh, to deal with multiple and data tables and mismatching uh, observations, like in this case. Uh, so we are exploring, uh, and we will work more on this, of uh, actually supporting the use of new data table. This is uh, something that also the user asked. So finally, I want to uh, talk about uh, the other parts of the framework that we are working on. We got... Uh, multiple feedback from the users, and one is the performance. We want to improve it, uh, both in uh, interactive plotting and in uh, static plotting. For instance, if we have hundreds of millions of points, and if you have uh, this gen, Emeroscope data, this is an example, in which uh, we don't want to plot all the points like vector data. We want to rasterize them, maybe with data shaders. So we are working on this. One is uh, making a uh, better uh, uh, use of spatial indexing. If you want to do a query operation on, again, hundreds of millions of points, we can use spatial indexing because we build on geospatial libraries. But maybe it will be convenient to save it to disk so that if we call multiple times uh, this operation, we can uh, speed up the computation. We don't do it right now, but uh, there is no reason of not doing. So we want to actually try it out when we, uh, we have a use case of uh, a very large data set with the vector data. We want to work on user friendliness by uh, creating more tutorials and documentations and more uh, readers. We are building right now a reader for uh, stereo, um, stereo sick uh, data. And uh, uh, we want also to provide uh, converters, again, the user asked them for uh, this uh, feature between a different transformation system like ITK or Matplot, Matplotlib transformations. The users also asked to refine the data models by extending the Z support. We already support 3D data, but we can improve certain functions. So like we can't query 3D data yet, but we could implement it. And other users asked to implement the T support, since there are use cases in which the tensor contains a T component and NZFF allows to save the T component and also XRA allows for this, so we, we can enable it. And finally, uh, we got asked to simplify the data types, uh, like unify points and circles. So we exam examined the 
the implications and probably will uh, also simplify the data types and the next iteration. Finally, we will implement uh, better IO APIs. Right now, as I said before, it's already possible to save the output of an operation inside the same object, what we call incremental IO, but it's not very user-friendly, uh, some parts of it, and we are working on it. Next week should be uh, implemented. And also, we got asked uh, to have uh, more control of what is lazy and what not. So we will let the user, uh, by default, load everything in a lazy way, but then the user will be able to load and keep in memory certain part, parts of the object. These are some implications because the uh, I.O. becomes a bit more complex to implement, but uh, we are working on this. So this uh, was regarding features that we are working on. And uh, the last uh, three slides uh, will be on uh, um, interoperability. So with spatial data, we build uh, on top of uh, a Python uh, tech stack that contains a single cell libraries, geospatial libraries, Napari, and a link with a deep learning ecosystem. So we're already linking together with different libraries within the Python world. But an advantage is that since we're using OME ZAR following the NZFS specification to store the data, and this is language agnostic, we have the possibility of creating a link with different programming languages, in particular the R spatial omics libraries and interactive viewers in different programming languages. So right now we are putting the focus in discussions with developers from the Bioconductor uh, world and uh, the test developers to allow, for instance, uh, a JavaScript-based browser visualization of the data without having to download. You can see it uh, from the browser, from the cloud, without uh, having to download the, the full data. And uh, there is uh, something more to, to mention that uh, um, within Python, now there are a few uh, libraries that have been developed for working with uh, spatial omics data, like uh, EM Object from Enable Medicine and the Voyager uh, Pi. And uh, within the Python world, since uh, we are both base, uh, basing our objects in something that is similar to NData, we could imagine that we can convert uh, our data between uh, these uh, libraries without having to, to go through the ZAR storage. We, we can still start from disk storage, but if the object is already in memory, we can just do an in-memory conversion. And uh, right now, this is not possible in the R world because uh, the, the only link uh, um, is on the disk storage. But uh, what we have is that uh, Helena, um, she will uh, uh, talk more about this uh, in another meeting, uh, is uh, developed uh, what she called the special data in R. And uh, this is uh, our implementation of the disk storage that allows uh, then other libraries to work directly from this R implementations. And uh, here I want really to acknowledge Helena for her incredible work. Uh, we just uh, uh, supervise, uh, discuss a bit what she, she did all the implementation. And she also showed an example of uh, how now other uh, spatial omics libraries in R, like molecular experiment, uh, can uh, interface with spatial data in R without having uh, to re-implement the reader from NZFF. So I'm really excited about this. So how do we facilitate uh, the R developers or external developers uh, to build uh, on top of the file format? And uh, this is uh, what I will uh, describe in the next two slides. So first, uh, I, I describe uh, how we make the framework stable. Because if uh, we have other tools that are building on top of the format we output, uh, we need to have a format that is uh, very solid on disk. So we do this uh, by having a series of uh, uh, tests for each repository that we have. So this is standard in the Python world. Every commit, we have uh, a test for the various libraries. But on top of this, we have uh, conversion scripts uh, uh, data downloaders that then uh, convert the data and re-upload the data in Zara. And then we have various notebooks that are both documentation notebooks, uh, paper reproducibility notebooks, uh, and notebooks for developers. This is uh, what is used for interoperability. So we test everything uh, every night uh, in an end-to-end -end way using uh, uh, Airflow pipeline that uh, so prompt us uh, quickly if there is a change uh, in the data. So this allows for us to build something that is uh, robust. The developers of different programming languages can look at this resource, I show this in the next slide, that every night uploads uh, the converted data so they can build tests on top of this. So let, let's see this more in detail. And why do we need this? We need this because the NZFF and special data formats are still evolving. The implementation that we did on top of the NZFF specification is sometimes uh, very stable, like the image representation is very stable and used by many tools, but the other parts are not merged in main yet. Like the transformations, operations, uh, we see some implementation from uh, some uh, tools, uh, like uh, Neuroglancer from uh, Google, but uh, they are not uh, stable yet. 
And also the special data format, as I show in the previous slide, needs some tweaks that we want to do. And we aim at having the special data version 1.0 that is uh, uh, stable for this. But before this happens, we have uh, these two ways to provide the developers of uh, capturing changes in the format. The first is data versioning. Every element within the file format contains a version number that can be checked by the readers. But most importantly, and here is what I showed in the previous slide, is that every night we run a series of notebooks that uh, covers uh, some cases uh, of the store specification. And if you consider all the notebooks, uh, they cover most of the stores. Eventually, we'll cover all the stores as cases. And every night, uh, we upload uh, the czar output from these notebooks. So as uh, uh, And we do this in, in Git. So as a R developer, uh, for instance, you could uh, every night have a script that uh, uh, checks out the latest version of the data, runs some tests, if the test work, then you have a guarantee that uh, the R reader will work on any data set. If the test don't work, well, this is Git version, so you can see exactly what changed in the previous uh, version, and you can uh, easily be guided to fix uh, the, the corresponding part. This is until uh, the special data version 1.0. If uh, you want to, to reach out to us uh, for discussions on interoperability, but also users questions, uh, feature requests, uh, feedback, bug report, uh, on the bottom here of the special data readme in uh, GitHub, you can find the contact form. And in particular, every two weeks, uh, we have uh, some open Zoom calls for the community covering different time zones. So you're welcome to join uh, the discussion. And with this, uh, I want to conclude. So I presented uh, the special data framework. Uh, that is a collaborative effort uh, that uh, is divided in different uh, packages for uh, visualization uh, and uh, data manipulation. And I talk about the OME and ZFF and how we are helping uh, extending it and uh, testing uh, it to store not just images, but also special omics data set. And uh, I want to thank uh, the many people that uh, collaborate in the project, uh, in particular uh, Giovanni, Isaac, and Kevin that uh, are uh, uh, together with me, core developers of the library. I want to thank uh, our PIs for the support and all the people that helped uh, with uh, the paper or with the implementation. I want to thank the funding, uh, San Zuckerberg Initiative, for the work, um, for funding the work, and I uh, want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Luca, uh, for a really great talk um, and uh, really an impressive amount of work that has gone into this one. Um, uh, if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to um, ask them. Maybe I start. Um, I I'm interested in um, what's typically involved in like creating a spatial uh, data object, right? You have listed kind of like the anatomy, uh, the typical anatomy of a spatial data object consisting of like um, images, a mask, labels, points, and, and these end data tables. Now, for some technologies, you might have a subset of those, you might have all of those, you might have only one or two of those. So um, uh, can you can you uh, maybe um, point out what are kind of like mandatory um, uh, components of a spatial data object and what are um, optional components of a, spa a spatial data object? Yeah. So we let the user have a full flexibility on this. Uh, the user can create a special data object that is uh, completely empty without uh, anything inside. Uh, can have uh, just one table, can have uh, just geometries without annotations. Uh, uh, it's really up to the user to decide uh, what to have inside. Uh, what uh, is always there is that if there is uh, one uh, geometry, then there is at least one coordinate system. By default, we create a coordinate system called global. But uh, except for, and, and what we have, if the user doesn't specify it, uh, let's say that the user puts an image, then there will be the image that is mapped to global with an identity transformation. So this is uh, uh, the assumption of uh, default information. But uh, uh, up to this uh, is, is up to the user. And the user also can decide to create multiple special data objects. Uh, there may be multiple samples that are very large. So the user may want to keep them in separate uh, SAR stores. And uh, by sharing the same name of the coordinate systems, uh, one can still uh, take and load them together. So when uh, using the aggregation operation, you can combine elements from different objects. Uh, when uh, calling in a party, you can open multiple ZAR stores at the same time uh, is uh, up to, to the user. Great. And I think you mentioned all kinds of like extensions and requests from users. And it's all like this one who uh, requested um, uh, extensions of the IO. Uh, API, I think um, 
this is really like crucial for like broad adoptions that users can easily convert um, uh, into the framework. So I thought I looked a little bit through that um, spatial data IO, which I think is really great, where you kind of like read from different technologies and provide um, 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 already converted objects in ZAR formats for all major technologies. But I thought it would be really great. It would be like very easy and accessible. Okay, I start, you know, like with a TIFF or I start like with an OME TIFF and how do I go from there with a bit more of pros uh, into, into, into a spatial data object? I think that will be super useful. Yeah, th thanks for uh, pointing this, uh, point to this. Uh, it's something that uh, we got asked also from uh, um, other users uh, to maybe have a common line interface. Maybe this could be uh, an option that uh, if you have some uh, file extensions that uh, are uh, popular, like uh, TIFF or I don't know, even PNC and so on, maybe you don't even need to open Python. You can uh, convert it from a common line. So we have this in the to-do list, uh, but we haven't uh, uh, implemented it yet. We, we Thanks for feedback. We, we can put more priority on this. It would be definitely useful. <laughs> All right, other questions for Luca? Well, I'll go. Uh, hello, Luca. Uh, Tyrone Lee from CCB. Um, I have a question about the in-memory implementation from, is that from, uh, the, is this in-memory in from memory star? I'm just curious, because you said, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that a lot of these representations tend to uh, tend to be somewhat sparse in or uh, sometimes sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're quite they're quite dense in certain regions right there. And are a lot of the some, some one of the ways we try to do that into space some uh, experiment experiment matrix or exper summarize exper experiment does is that you can implement this this no what is called bumpy matrix which has an additional no that dimension for it's just a sparse array but in some areas are quite dense i'm trying to figure out how is your memory implementation yeah, implementation uh how do you do that do that without what running into mem memory errors right there because some of these especially for the image data they can balloon quite uh, balloon quite big quite big right there is there some memory handling on that's done on the spatial side or do you just rely on some other uh in memory libraries. I know X arrays have some in memory implementation down in C right there, but there's some nitty greedy in that, which doesn't seem to work all, always in SC verse. So I'm curious how you're getting around that. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. So to uh, answer, I share one slide. It will be useful. It's one of the first one. Let me do like this. So this one here. So here we see the in-memory representation of the object. And uh, we see in this case that the, the image is, um, uh, well, here it says spatial image. So this is actually an X-ray data ray object. Uh, there is a PR that we want to merge to, to change this wording, but this object is X-ray data ray. It's just a, um, a subclass and uh, it's a bit uh, hidden behind. Uh, here we have uh, a, a data frame, which is uh, actually read from disk, so it's a, it's a lazy data frame. And this is Zeo Pandas uh, data frame that are both in memory, they are very small. And uh, in this data object, uh, we have, uh, in this case, uh, this uh, matrix that uh, is uh, dense, but uh, this matrix can be, can be sparse. And um, ZAR doesn't allow yet, sorry, and data doesn't allow yet to read from ZAR lazily. It uh, allows to read from SDF5 lazily. There is a PR to work on this also for Zara. So when this will be done, the user will have a possibility to represent this matrix not just in a sparse way that is already possible, but also lazy from uh, end data. So this is a contribution from uh, end data uh, developers. And regarding uh, the X-ray data array object, so this is a is a is a full X-ray object. So this means that okay. uh, in this case is uh, is lazy. And if you have a very large image. It is chunked, so you can uh, do a parallel processing on every chunk. You can uh, add using X-ray APIs a padding on the chunks uh, to the operation for each chunk, and then remove the padding, and then stitch everything together, so this is already allowed. And uh, finally, here 
the special emails contains just one resolution, but if we have uh, a very large emails, uh, what we do is that we downscale it also. So we have uh, the various scales with all the chunks. Uh, so it's uh, a X-ray data tree object that again is a standard from X-ray and it can use the convenience function from those libraries. Interesting. So it's a melange of different technology put, put into that. It's not really showing up in this particular example that you're showing that these are from on disk or on, mem or, or on memory. So it's everything is completely different whenever you're building an object. Um, yeah, so we are um, we, we, we want to show better maybe in the output, in the wrapper, the string representation, what is loading, what's not, what not, when uh, we finalize uh, the the option for a user to load the parts in memory and part uh, leaving them lazy. But the idea is that um, if uh, you are a Python user and you work with images, uh, there is a high chance that you already use X-Ray and you already use a multi-scale representation. If you're working with polygons, probably you're using Zopandas and with matrices you're using and data. So that's why we decided not to create uh, new data types, uh, but to adopt uh, these data types uh, and uh, have ways to link them together. The way we link them together is in two ways. The first is uh, by using coordinate systems that can put them in relationship and by having APIs that can combine the various layers uh, together. Maybe, so, maybe, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just asking, you said they all unified by the same coordinate system right there. So are we using just Cartesian, Cartesian for everything right there? Or is that what you mentioned before with the multiple uh, uh, spatial systems, where you say, for instance, if you're not using Cartesian, uh, if everything's not, for example, let's say you have to, like somebody made a really weird Mur uh, Murphy's experiment where you have two slices on the same, on the same coordinates, so you want to, but you want to recenter one of the slices off, uh, off, and it's offset by like certain amount of, uh, amount of X or Z, <laughs> y, or, y or Z. If you have the Aligned to the new coordinate system, the original zero zero Cartesian system is not going to you're not going to see that sli that slice that slice at all. So how so if you're not if you're not using um how are you managing these assumptions then if you're using just different coordinate systems or then user customizable is that not possible? Um. So I'm, I'm not sure if I understood correctly the, the question. I'll try to re-ask the question. What if you have two Murphish uh, samples that are not for the same, let's say, plane or the same volume, but they have a shift that needs to be taken so the coordinate 0, 0 here is not the coordinate 0, 0 here? Uh, was this some, 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 the latter? The, the latter. Its coordinate system is not aligned to the center right there. Let's say you're not having one slice. Let's say the the experimenter tries to be lazy and puts in four slices into one where it should be one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So uh, the way I would do this, uh, probably I would uh, take the four slices. Uh, I would uh, subset them using the query APIs. Put them now in four different objects. Uh, and now the coordinates that are local for each of these new coordinate systems, I can call them coordinate systems like 0, 1, 2, 3. Now they can be every, anything in relation to each other. So now I can have uh, the, the coordinate system uh, physical slide that contains the slide 0, 1, 2, 4. And uh, now the, the global coordinates are the one that I get from the microscope. The local can be the same or can be starting from 0 every time. And then uh, if they actually also aligned together in the same physical field of view, I can create an extra coordinate system that I call the, I don't know, aligned coordinate system in which uh, I define the translations or the affine transformation or no linear transformation when it will be implemented to put everything together. And uh, if I'm very happy with this alignment, I can also commit to it. So I actually transform the data and just work on the new transfer data. If I'm still not sure, because maybe the biologists want to focus on a particular zoom part of the data in which maybe a, a different uh, alignment is better, then I keep the raw data and the biologist can always adjust this and operate with this new alignment. All right. So um, maybe as we're going to the end of the hour, I check whether there is one more question in the audience. Is there any more? Are there any more questions? Yeah.
if this is not the case, we have another hour for discussion just coming up uh, on the our bioconductor interoperability. Thank you so much, Luca. That was really a, a fantastic talk. Thank you for the time. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, we will meet next week uh, on a seminar on a precision medicine um, knowledge graph. So if that is an, a subject of interest to you, very welcome to join. And other than that, um, have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody.